Hi, Tanya. Let's get ready to rock. All right. So the first thing that I want to do is I'll just let it run here a little bit. And of course, Mo feeds you to the back end there, but I'm looking at your forehand. There's a couple of things right off the bat. When you're being fed the ball there, but I'm assuming this is also true for when you're playing, is on most all of the balls, you're moving back. And of course, when you're moving back, that indicates that, yeah, ball is deep and it's probably going to put you under time pressure and you tend to hit the ball a little late. So the very first fix when you're playing is not just when you're getting balls fed or you're on the ball machine, whatever it is, simply slide back a little bit. One, two racket length is enough because I'd rather have you move forward to the ball than being move back. The second thing is, when do you start the unit turn, right? When do you start to turn? So you see the ball is moving, 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 and it's about here now, and it's about to bounce, but your racket is nowhere near back, right? You're just starting the take back. So ideally, as a rule of thumb, and this is where the ball bounces here. As a rule of thumb, as the ball bounces, you want to be at the furthest point of your take back and you're still basically sideways to your body here, right? And you're still taking it back still. Okay, now we're dropping. So you are keeping it to the right side of your body, which is good. Although I don't necessarily have a preference of the WTA forehand or ATP, whatever it is, but the point is that you're just waiting a little too long with the take back, right? And this is one of the few balls where you're actually able to take it here on the baseline. But then I want to nag on the second thing. Your contact point is a little too low, right? So you could have actually moved up a little bit more. And I don't want to give you necessarily 15,000 different things to work on. So the very first Two things are start back a little bit more, start your preparation a little sooner. So as the ball bounces, you're turned more. I want the left arm still out here, right? We see your hand basically out here and you want to turn more because that gives you more shoulder turn, more hip turn, and it automatically takes the racket back as well a little bit more and ideally with your footwork you are adjusting to the ball every single time so that you can catch the ball between hip and shoulder and for most people it's still hip to waist is the most comfortable but we should be able to control it between hip and shoulder. But you do see here, that's okay in terms of height, but you see that it's way too close and it's next to you. We'll see that then from the side. So again, an earlier turn. So ball bounces, racket back, racket back, racket back. So at this point, I would love to see the tip of your racket pointing to us. And we'll go over that from the side. You'll see it a little bit better. Because that is too late. And I'm worried then eventually that you're either getting wrist issues or elbow issues. In addition to you're not going to generate any power from here. Right? And you see that here. You miss it in the net. So you're getting jammed there a little bit. So those are the first couple of things. I'm going to go into one that's a little bit more, oops, I want to say complicated, not really, but we'll work on it when you're here. But you can start watching some of the videos that actually recently I've made because I have happened to run into that issues a bunch of times. It's talking about the wrist lag. Your grip is perfectly fine. So it's not dependent on the grip whether you can achieve a good wrist lag or not. But you see that here, that your wrist is straight. At this position here, 
we would like to have the wrist basically laid back and this is where the tip of the racket points back and there is a position called the lock in position and that basically signifies the end of the preparation and it would be that at that point the butt cap of the racket points to the ball and you see that that never happens here in your forehand and i'm going to put you next to ash barty to show you even more what i mean so if we're looking at ash here she has a very high but you see here as she's starting to take the racket back do you see that the side with which she's going to hit is pointing to the outside pointing to the outside now it's starting to point down 45 degrees at some point it's even more but more importantly, you see this bend. And that never happens for you. So if you keep your wrist completely straight like that, you would not be able to make contact out here in front because if you met the ball out in front, the racket face would be positioned this way and you would miss every single ball this way. And that's why it's more comfortable to let it come parallel to you. However, that's not the most effective way to hit a forehand. So this here is the lock-in position, butt cap to the ball. The tip of the racket is lagging back, but now as she's pulling up and forward to contact point, now she's level here again. The tip of the rack is in line with the wrist and you see a clear distance here. There's still a bend here and that's not the problem, but you see the air that she has here and there's no air here. And that all comes from that wrist lag. So I'll also put some links in the description um, so that you can see even more and also work a little bit on the drills. And um, yeah, we're gonna work on that a lot when you're here then, but that really is, I think, one of the bigger things. Okay, if I let this run here, I think you're seeing the same things right away in the court position here. So again, you're starting every ball basically from a very, very aggressive court position, but then you're being pushed back on every single ball, right? So start back here, start back here and then move forward. A gives you more time and it's not going to feel as jammed and as rushed. And then we're also seeing variations of the contact point quite a bit. So if I speed this up a little bit, so this is too low. You saw that you make contact almost by your shin there. That's also kind of low. And also that has to do with the lack of the wrist lag. Because again, if you had the lag there, and I'm gonna wind this forward a little bit, right? The way that your wrist is positioned here, and it's a little harder to see because we don't have as many frames, it's really difficult to make contact out in front, which will also allow you to contact the point a little, the ball a little higher. So that's really the benefit of that wrist lag as well, that you can move into balls you can control better that are higher, right? So you don't have to drop back as far to let them drop back where it's comfortable. And that gives you a more aggressive court positioning that hopefully then you can maintain when you make the adjustment with the wrist. Then you don't have to move back. Then you're gonna feel a lot more comfortable catching that ball higher and that's gonna make you a much more aggressive player without having to hit harder because you can take time away from your opponent by taking balls here as opposed to all the way back. But in the meantime, do scoot back, move up. Let's also talk about that unit turn, right? We'd, I already said that it's a little late, but it could also be way more extreme. So you see that here, you're starting to take the racket back and that's already when you're separating your hands and your left 
stays in front. And then it just drops to the side. And again, you see that you hit the ball here very late. So ideally, you would turn and leaving the racket in your hand longer so that you only separate when the left arm has cleared your midline. And that gives you a deeper unit turn. And again, that takes the racket back in the correct way. All right, and you see that here again, the side with which you're hitting is facing to us here. And it's never really coming down and the wrist here, that, that is ouchy to me. So I'm gonna yell at you a lot for that when I see you in person. So again, let's put Ash next to you. So one little difference is there, she has the hand on the throat of the racket. I don't necessarily think that's something you wanna work on, but the left arm here definitely helps her lift the racket. Now see here when her hands separate, she is at midline, but even after she separates, that left arm continues to come around and you see that basically her nose almost touches her chin and that just brings that upper body in the proper position, it brings the hip into the proper position, but even more importantly, it brings the racket in the right position. So if I see at the furthest point here, see the turn, the difference here, and then, of course, the ball here on your side is already coming in. It's still very far away on Ash's side. So you do have a racket drop, but definitely not as pronounced as this here. And you also see now where that wrist lag is again. This is an extended wrist. And here we have that wrist lag. And that basically is just pulling, pushing on the inside of the grip and having your arm very relaxed so that basically the weight of the racket lags back. But then again, as she's pulling up and forward, here it catches up. And this is that lock-in position. So the ball's gonna come in here in a second, right there, but we did see the butt cap. And again, that never happens here. And then, of course, that contact point also really, you know, informs your follow through. It's really difficult to follow through properly if you make contact that late. All right, so ideally we want to follow through and then the side with which you hit the racket points to the outside here. But the number one really is see if you can really, really, really relax that wrist and that entire arm and just let the weight of the racket do a lot of the work for you.